It's time for another Dirt Daily, and we are still in the shop with the Giveaway Gladiator. The Giveaway Gladiator is the Gladiator that one of you is going to win. All you have to do is go to the Cal Four Wheel website and buy a raffle ticket. Cal Four Wheel is an organization in the state of California that fights to keep trails open, and every year they raffle off a vehicle. This year I've been helping out with some upgrades on this brand new Jeep Gladiator. Uh, bumpers, fenders, rock sliders, lifted suspension, bigger tires, and today we're gonna to do an upgrade that really won't change the way the vehicle looks, but it'll definitely change the way it performs off-road. That's right, today, lower gears in the axles and locking differentials. These will help transmit power and torque out to each tire, so no matter if a tire is in the air or in the mud, they'll all keep spinning and with a flip of the switch, you can change it back to an open differential and run down the highway, no problem. Plus, having lower gears will take some strain off of the engine, transmission, transfer case, drive shafts, everything upstream, so that you can turn those bigger 37-inch BFGs without a whole lot of wear and tear on the vehicle. So, we're gonna get to work today. Oh, my buddy Eric Falar is gonna show up to help me out. He was on a couple of those Dirt Every Day episodes when we did the Cheap Truck Challenge with some XJs and also when we did the Overland builds. So Eric's gonna show up, he actually works with Motive Gear and Motive Gear is supplying a set of, I believe it's 488 ring and pinion. And then we have some E-lockers from Eaton. So we're gonna bolt all this stuff in and by the end of the day, have more traction. Let's get to work. I'm gonna start on the front axle. Uh, the front axle will need to have access to the differential cover right here in the middle. So it's going to be easiest to just remove the tie rod. So I'm going to disconnect the two bolts at either end and drop the tie rod out. Also disconnect the steering stabilizer right here. And then I'm going to put a pan under it and start draining the oil out. And while the oil drains out, I can start tearing apart the knuckles and pull the axle shafts out. In order to get the differential out, you have to pull the axle shafts out. So you basically have to disassemble the thing completely. So we'll start with that tie rod. A lot of these newer JL Wranglers and Gladiators use a nylock on the steering tie rods. Um, I don't really know why. It used to have a steering tie rod end would go up through here and you'd use a castle nut, which would have a, it would screw it down and then you'd put a cotter pin through it. <sighs> Nylocks are great once. I don't really like to reuse them. This tie rod is from SteerSmart and Hypothetically, I probably should have put that on last after we did the ring and pinion, but I think what I'm gonna do now is track down some new nylocks or see if I can order a new set of nylocks so that you're not reusing them. I think they're fine for that one time, um, but I don't know why they changed from castle nuts to nylocks on these later Jeeps. Maybe it's just easier assembly when it's going down the assembly line. Hey, buddy. Hey, Fred. You have more cars than <laughs> <here next. laughs> cars. I'm winning, right? That means I'm winning, right? <laughs> I pulled the diff cover. I let the oil drain out. Uh, I'm going to start disassembling the front of the axle. I'm going to remove the brake calipers. I'm going to try something that I haven't done in the past on one of these axles where I'm going to see if I can remove the three bolts that hold the unit bearing on and slide the brake rotor and the uh, axle shafts and everything out in one unit. It might not work. Mm, actually, that's not going to work now that I think about it because I have a speed sensor here. So I will have to remove 
the brake rotor, which is just one more fastener. I was just trying to think of ways to make it come apart quickly, but it looks like I'm going to take this giant nut off, remove the brake rotor, remove the speed sensor, and then I can finally remove the unit bearing. I was trying to jump ahead, um, but I don't think that will work. Plus there's a dust shield on the back here that might get in the way. And here is the speed sensor that you have to undo and then we can remove the unit bearing and probably pull the whole axle shaft right with it. It looks like this dust shield can probably stay. I removed the caliper, I removed the rotor, I removed the speed sensor, I removed the three bolts that hold the unit bearing in and now this should all slide out and pull the axle shaft with it. We're going to set this somewhere clean so that we can reassemble it once we have the new gears in. On the passenger side of this front axle, there is the FAD, which is the front axle disconnect. And it is basically like a motor that engages the long side of the axle shaft. So I believe we have to remove that completely from the axle housing in order to pull the long side axle shaft out. It does have a little skid plate that's held on with four bolts and then we will find out what is behind that and if it just is bolted in and falls right out or if it's some sort of convoluted mess. Oh, look at that. Pretty simple little Shifter arm. That looks like it can just hang right there. And then inside here, there's a collar that actually slides over and engages both sides of the long shaft. That's kind of neat. It's pretty simple. So on the inner long side axle shaft, there is a little tiny snap ring. Actually, it's kind of a big snap ring. And that holds the axle shaft from going too far in, but it also stops it from going all the way out. We're gonna leave that snap ring for now, and hopefully by sliding it over as far as it'll go, right before it hits the outer seal, it will get it out of the differential and we can drop the differential. We may need to come back and remove that snap ring, but hopefully, it slides over just about two inches. Hopefully that's enough that we can pull the uh, differential and the ring gear and the axle shaft will clear. If not, we just have to come back and mess with that. There's that little snap ring. this drive shaft up here out of the way and then nothing is impeding our oh boy oh boy actually maybe I'll put it on that side this is my buddy Eric Falar Eric works for Motive Gear Eric decided he would come up and help me out with the ring and pinion on the giveaway gladiator uh, this has, I think it's 373 gears. 373 is right now with a track lock in the back and just an open differential in the front. Which is kind of cool. I didn't even realize that the Gladiators were optioned with a track lock or with any sort of limited slip. I would be willing to bet that they are optioned only with a track lock because they're supposed to be super heavy duty because they're truck like. That would make sense. Yeah. Plus it's like, it tells you that you could at least have some traction device versus nothing at all. Way better than nothing at all. Yeah. Um, and today we're doing a set of 488 gears from Motive Gear. Correct. And we have a brand new ring and pinion plus an install kit. That's something that uh, you have to think about when you order a ring and pinion. You're going to probably want an install kit because it'll have side bearings, pinion bearings, seals, 
crush sleeve, uh, ring gear bolts, everything in a master bearing kit. This one being brand new, we probably don't need most of those parts because there's hardly any miles on this. Um, but if, it, uh, if you're a little more worn in, a great time to change those bearings. So we'll probably reuse a lot of this stuff, um, which will give us uh, starting points with shims and that kind of stuff too. So before you even take anything else, I mean, we've already taken the axle shafts, brakes and all that drive shafts. What do we need to know about the ring and pinion before we disassemble it before, so that we know where we're starting? Um, before we, well, you could, there's no real reason to take any pre-measurements. Uh, essentially, we're gonna start all over anyway. Um, what we do know about this is the JTs come with a 210, or more commonly known as a Dana 44. The 210 metric measurement is closer to like a Chrysler eight and a quarter versus the rear, which is a 220. Okay. Um, which is closer to like your standard 44. These come with a much thicker pinion than a 44. So they're actually a really strong option to the old school 44 that we're used to. Okay. And is that the Advantech gears? The that, Advantech, yeah. That's what Dana calls it? Yeah, it's been a while now that they went to the metric version uh, or the uh, nomenclature anyway. Um, I just call it a Dana 44. Yeah. <laughs> the front's a high pinion. Uh, the rear is low pinion, which is what you want. In most vehicles, you want the high pinion in the front. That's where they're usually stronger. And we are going to pull this out, uh, remove the carrier, the ring gear, and the pinion. And then we are swapping in not only some new 488 gears, but also some e-lockers from uh, Eaton, which will allow you to switch, flip a switch, and that will lock the differentials for more off-road traction. So uh, where do we start? Pull the We're going to pull these cap bolts off and get this carrier out. Uh, hopefully it won't give us too much. It has, it should have a fair amount of preload. Um, so we're going to use a, some kind of a pry bar to knock that thing out. Uh, and then we'll drop the pinion. Uh, we're going to pull the pinion bearing off so we can get a starting shim. Um, knowing our gear, we, we manufacture our gear to be very consistent. So we only manufacture one plant, our plant. Um, so the one cool part about ours is it's easy to set up. We're going to, I know for a fact that these JTs need an extra 5,000 shim with my gear. So we're going to add five right off the bat and put it together. And I would bet 99% of the time we're going to be done. Nice. We won't run a pattern. Yeah. Cool. Keeping nice to have easy. quality parts and nice to have a little bit of experience. And so today we're going to throw this thing together. I'm going to start by removing the bearing caps. Uh, the bearing caps need to go on the same way that they come off. So you will want to take a photo of it. They do have part numbers on it that are different from side to side. Um, either take a good photo of it or mark on the center section on the casting, a mark that will match up with a mark on the um, bearing caps or you can use a paint pen. You just don't want to get these reversed and run one on the other side or upside down. There we go. This should be pretty tight, but whenever you're doing this, you wanna keep a hand on it because you don't want your differential to come flopping out. Also don't drop the bolts on the ground. Now what I wanna do is pry the ring gear and the carrier out. There's these two bearings on the sides that have shims behind them. Um, <clears throat> I usually put a, a wrench on one of the ring gear bolts and then I come on the bottom and just kind of pry out. And this can sometimes help it all just pop right out. I'm going to turn this so that I can pry against the carrier, like right here. Get a bigger pry bar. There it goes. Oh, you know what? I wonder if we're hitting that axle shaft. Oh, that's. Reach inside this hole. Let's see if it's loose. 
and see if it's tight. Oh, it's bound up really good. Okay. So that's our problem. So let's give her, where's that uh, mallet? We'll knock it back in. And probably the JLs. We figured out that the axle shaft that we slid out and was hoping it would clear, it doesn't. It's still in the journal of the front differential. So we're gonna pull that little snap ring off and then we can pull this out. There it goes. Yep. We're ready for you. You ready? Yep. Okay. This side has a big old spacer. Yeah, so we're gonna both sides. take note of our shims on each side because that's what we're gonna start with. All right. So I got so you have that spacer. That's your side shim, and I have this one. You hold on to that. We'll write this down on the bench that says this is passenger side and that's the driver's side. Eric, what are you doing? Um, I actually just was curious what the original pinion preload uh, in inch pounds was. So on the rear, the front is totally normal. It just uses a regular old um, roller bearing, tapered roller bearing. But the rear has a really funny double ball bearing style outer, outer pinion bearing. This is new for the, the JLs and JTs, yeah. So we're gonna, like that one, we're gonna be real careful about. We're gonna make sure that we match the pinion preload resistance um, on the rear. And okay. that's gonna go by feel, but we're also gonna take yes. a measurement on it. Um, this one is- So the preload is like how tight the bearings are. Exactly, yeah. So if it's over tightened, then there's not enough room for oil to get between the rollers and the race and kablammo, thing blows up on you. And if it's under tightened. Then it's moving, uh, your pinion pattern is gonna, or your uh, ring gear pattern is gonna walk every time you put it under power. And, and also uh, kablammo. And also kablammo, yeah. So no kablammo is the way to go. Yeah, we're shooting for zero kablammo. <laughs> which uh, in most cases is about 24 inch pounds on a regular new bearing, which is exactly what this is right now. So the pinion has two bearings. It has an inner bearing and an outer bearing. Correct. And that and you want the preload so that it, it rolls at the perfect amount of like resistance, but also the depth. Uh, so we're gonna go into pinion depth. So that the pinion depth on these is set behind the inner pinion bearing, it's the shim thickness. And that's what's gonna set our ring gear pattern that you'll hear a lot about if you're doing this kind of stuff. And the ring gear pattern, what we're looking for is a centered ring gear pa uh, pattern between the root of the gear, the very deepest part of the ring gear, uh -huh. and the top of the gear, which is the highest part. We're looking for a centered pattern. We're looking for no sharp edges. So it's going to look like uh, one way I heard it uh, explained recently. It was a great idea. It should look like a little hamburger bun. So it, like a football. Okay. Um, so that's the pattern we're going to look for. And that uh, we'll take pictures of that. I assume when we get there. So we're basically going to adjust uh, the depth of the pinion in and out of the housing. And then also the sides of the carrier that has the ring gear so that the gears on the pinion and the gears on the ring gear mesh perfectly because it's basically taking power in from the drive shaft and turning it at 90 degrees and running it out the axle shafts. That's what I said. That's what he said. No kablammo, no zero kablammo. If you ever leave Motive and start your own gear company, you could call it zero kablammo. <laughs> no kablammo. <laughs> If you so, want to punch it, I'll hold it and catch it when she comes out. So I'm going to hit the center of the pinion. Ring and pinion jobs are funny because it's like a mixture of like fine equipment and hammers. I was trying to explain to people it's not, we're not building rockets. It's not rocket surgery. Right there. All right. Perfect. How many years of schooling do you have to go to to be a rocket surgeon? Uh, a lot more than I did to work on cars, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the car gig seems to be working. <laughs> the car thing's paying the bills. Rocket surgery, not so much. So behind the flange where the drive shaft attaches to the pinion, there is a seal, so the pinion sticks out this way and then the drive shaft attaches there. And behind that seal 
is the outer roller bearing for the pinion. So all of the shims are underneath the races, correct? Uh, underneath the bearing, actually, not, not the race. Uh, in some cases, though, we got Dana 35, often shims behind the race. This particular one shims behind the bearing. Behind the bearing. Behind so, the bearing on the pinion. Okay, so if I... So are there shims behind here? Not in this case. Okay. In some cases, though, it can be that way. And you can actually shim either way. Uh, you could, it, it, it achieves the same thing. So you can shim behind the bearings if that's the size uh, shim that you have, or you can shim behind the, uh, the race if you have a really big shim. So knock these races out? Uh, no. This is, you see your flashlight? This is, yeah. This is shim behind the, bear, uh, behind the race. You were right. So we're going to shim behind the race. So we're going to knock out this inner race. The inner one towards me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the outer one just stays? Yeah, it can just stay there. It's not setting any depth. Uh, we're going to reuse that bearing. No, uh, oh. if, if we were doing a full rebearing and everything, this thing has almost zero miles on it. Um, if it was 40,000 or more miles, I would definitely recommend new bearings. If you don't have the right tool to pull the bearings and change everything, you can mess up the bearings. So that's another good reason to... Uh, to just get a full master bearing kit, especially if you're, you're kind of new to it. So if you have a brand new Jeep and you're reusing all of the bearings, you really are just changing the pinion seal? And the crush leaf. And the crush leaf. Yeah. So is there like, so if this is a master install kit, is there a beginner, in, what would you call yes, it? Yes, uh, we have what we call a basic install kit, which is gonna come with uh, some shims, crush the seal, leaf. crush leaf, new nut, um, Things and that you have to replace. Yeah, and new rear gear bolts. Yeah. Okay. So but essentially everything that, that you need to install it without doing bearings. Got it. Which we probably could have got away with, but luckily we got it all in case we just in case we screw it up, up, which is likely the case. <laughs> I mean, other guys would probably screw it up, and we should show them how to. But we wouldn't on purpose. <laughs> all right. What am I doing? Knocking that race out? Yeah. Um, let's see if we can do it. Carefully. Hammer's on the ground behind your foot. And I'll keep my hand here so it doesn't... Catch all the stuff that comes shooting out. We're going to be real careful. There's actually a couple of notches in here that allow you to put your drift... Up in it. Up in it. Like a top and bottom one? Yeah. Which will allow us to get this thing out without damaging the existing shims. But if we do, we've got a whole master kit with the shims that we need, and we'll just mimic what's coming out of here. And like I said, I know our gear for a fact will set up with an extra five thousandths in the front of this JL. So we're just right off the bat going to add five thousandths, put it all together, and run our pattern. There you go. So the extra five thousandths, here's, here's what we're talking about. This is the race. The race is like a cone that the bearing sits in. This is the shim that goes behind it. Um, but there's only this one shim. Or is this multiple shims? Um, it can be just one. Uh, it's probably about 50 thousandths on the JL. Okay. Is there just one? Yeah. I only see one. Yeah. Nice. So we'll get our micrometer out and just double check just for our own... Um, our own information, we're gonna make note of what thickness that shim is. We're gonna add five to it. And one reason to make note is because if you ever call with a tech question and you get me on the phone, one of my questions is gonna be, what was your opinion depth shim? And uh, I want you to have that answer. So don't use a tape measure. No. <laughs> All right, so Eric is measuring the thickness of the shim that goes behind the race. Yeah, so I've got my old man glasses on here. We're gonna squeeze this thing. You mean young cool guy glasses. That's right. Uh, and like I said, I was thinking about 50 thou, this one is 48 thousandths. Okay. We went through our bearing kit here and we're gonna measure each one of these and see if we have a five thousandths. If not, we're, this is a three, we're gonna put a couple together three. until we make five thousandths. 
So three, we would need a two. Here's a five. So that made that easy. Look at that. It's so thin it just like disappears when you turn it sideways. Much like my biceps. Oh wait. Um. Yep. So that's an easy fix because that just means I grabbed the wrong shims. So you want the shim to be the same diameter as the old shim, and this one is the wrong one. Are these the right? That's more like it. So then we'll start that process over again. We'll do that again for the, you viewers that missed it. This is 48. And five. Okay. Also very thin. Um, so, if your tech guy knows that it needs 5 thou, why doesn't he just send you just a 5 thou shim? Um, why send all these other ones in case you booger this one up when you're taking it out? Yeah, people, yeah, yes, actually, you yeah, had to replace the one that you took out. So, a lot of the time, if you're not using the right drift or if you don't hit it in the right spot, you're going to mess it up or tear it up, and you want that shim to be flat and accurate. Um, and these bearing kits get used with all kinds of things. So not just our gear, it gets used with other people's gears or it gets used with an OE gear, you're just rebearing, you know, that kind of thing. This is a bearing race driver. It's basically a chunk of aluminum with like kind of an angle on it. This is your bearing race. It's gonna slide over that. These are our old shim and our new shim. So set the shims in there to start. I'm assuming both of them. Yeah. Yep. Does it matter if like the thin one is towards the back or the thick one? No. You probably um, want the thick one so that if you got to knock it out, you don't booger up the thin yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good call. But otherwise, it really it doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter. And then you want to get this race in here on top of all of that. And then. Did you buy a ticket to win this thing? I bought several. I'm not really sure if you're allowed to win because you're helping on the build, but I don't know that you're not allowed to. Well, I bought those tickets for the cause. I think that's I did even win. Better. That's what I like to hear. Eric Falar, waiting for our trails. In no way looking to win. <laughs> Free Jeeps. Free Jeep. Would probably just donate it back to the guy that built it. That kind of sounds like it's in there. It changed tone once it sort of bottomed out. That's how you know. It goes from soft to solid. Yeah, that sounds good. What would you say your claim to fame is in the off-road world? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, claim Clark. to fame. This doesn't have to go in the video, but I'm going to record it anyways, just in case it's something funny. And I can use it when you're getting inducted into the Armhoff or <laughs> some other Hoff, the Hasselhoff. <laughs> um, all right, if, I, if somebody asked me what did Eric Falar do in the off-road industry, I'd say, well, he, has, uh, he worked for an off-road shop that was kind of cutting edge back in the late 90s. 90s. Yeah. Um, he built a rig that won Top Truck Challenge. Yep. That was pretty groundbreaking. John Reynolds Bronco. Which was it a big deal back when Top Truck Challenge happened and was a big deal. Um, has raced multiple different types of desert racing in either a bright orange XJ that he wasn't scared to launch like the space shuttle or riding with the late great Pistol Pete. Uh-huh. 
So uh, I'd like to, I don't know, I mean, you've hit on just about everything. I, uh, from just being around and everything in this industry for 25 plus years, 28 years, um, I like to think that my, my real results were in the Baja 1000. I've raced the Baja 1000 like a dozen times, but I've won it five times in four different classes. And I like to think that someday somebody's going to remember me for that. But really what it is, is one time I jumped a Jeep H2. Cherokee, like 15 feet in the air. Yeah. And it the, was a photo that the old it. Jeep speed jump. Yeah. And you were taller before that jump, right? I was, I shrank about three <laughs> inches on the landing. <laughs> was your brother riding with you? No, it was actually my buddy, Luke who is now a, a parks ranger for a, a desert that we frequent all the time. Huh. Yeah. At that, my brother was this, he would have been the second driver had I been a little more patient and got the car to him. But so when you jumped it, did you just, did it? It broke all the bolts right out of the block. And the <laughs> engine <laughs> fell down. That, see that, nobody ever told me that it didn't just land and take you to the, uh, the winner's circle. I got it all the way to the, uh, all the way back to the pit, but that was after like it locked up the steering because there was an engine sitting on top of the steering shaft. and It broke all of the motor ripped mounts? Them, ripped them right out. I didn't rip them out of the block. It broke the block. <laughs> so they, uh, I, I fixed it so that I could do that again later, but never had the opportunity. But yeah, if it uh, turns out, if you jump a Jeep really, uh, really high. An XJ, even though XJs yeah. are impervious to abuse. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the greatest Jeeps ever made, uh, quoting other Jeepers. Yeah. <laughs> huh. yeah, but other than my humanitarian efforts, uh, that's where I think my real claim to fame came was, was being a bozo and race Jeeps. What all classes did you race in Baja? Uh, stock full of Jeeps. Uh, we run the 500 in Jeeps. We run uh, the 1000 a couple times in a XJ and a TJ. And that was Jeep Speed Jeep class? Speed back then, yeah. It still is actually. Jeep Speed still still around and uh, not as prevalent as it was back then, but it's still an awesome class. And then uh, I won it in stock full. I won it in class uh, seven. I won it. What were you in in stock full? Stock full was a guy out of uh, Texas. Had a, at the time, I want to say it was like a 2000. 11 brand it was brand new f-150 but he had the money to turn it into a race truck and Indeed. we raced that for a couple of years and we won it once and and then we had some dnfs in that one but and then uh, uh class is it two three thousand two thousand it was a uh, like four cylinder um truck on 33s that was a lot of work but we won it in that one <laughs> And I've had it in spec. Uh, four cylinder truck on 33s what was that like a tacoma it was a baja light which was one of Pistol Pete's um, uh, uh, little trucks to, to compete against um, trophy lights. Oh. So I forget, I forget what that class name was. I think it was 2000, something like that. Um, but then I've also I've got to race it a few times in spec trophy truck and was knocking on the door of a podium a few times and until we weren't anymore. Which is, <laughs> which is funny. That, I've, heard, I've heard that from a lot of racers. That's how that racing goes. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to win, and then you know something yeah. happened and caused me to not win. But it wasn't, it wasn't the driver's fault at all. <laughs> they're they're races of attrition, so you gotta you take your time until it's time to race again. So. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's talk about crush sleeves. Let's hold that guy up here and talk about what that is and what that does. So a crush sleeve in this particular unit is this little round thing. Uh, they come in different shapes and sizes for each differential. Um, some of the older differentials, the older Danas, will use what we call a pinion preload shim. And uh, what we're doing here is we're creating the pinion preload. So like I said, if it's too tight, there's not enough oil between the bearing and the race, and you're going to burn up the bearing, and kablamo. If it's too loose, it's going to allow the pinion to walk in and out or up and down, and it's going to walk all over your... Um, uh, ring gear pattern yeah the ring gear it's gonna wear it out and make all kinds of noise so what we're gonna do when we put this together is we're going to uh, we'll put the nut and the yoke on there with this with the new pinion or the new crush leaf we'll tighten it down and we'll find when it finally hits that crush leaf there's gonna be all kinds of play in there so then we're gonna start slowly cranking it down and crushing this crush leaf until the two bearings start seating into their races and eventually all the play will go away. And then we're looking for rolling resistance, which is our preload. So is the bearing, is the crush sleeve touching the two bearings or touching the races? The crush sleeve on this one is touching the two bearings. It's not okay. always the case, but on this one, the two bearings. So this thing 
starts out longer and as you tighten everything it kind of mushrooms out but as it's mushrooming out it's still forcing pressure on the bearings on either side and you want to make sure of the bearings on the race and the crush sleeve pushing out on the bearings in a happy spot where everything is yeah on this particular one we're going to set it to 24 inch pounds so it'll take us with no carrier just the ring gear in, or the pinion in there it's going to take us 24 inch pounds to make this thing turn um Which that really would isn't be that much it's not very much yeah you can get a feel for it but really the right way to do it is to use a, a, a an inch pound uh, torque wrench um this is this has so few miles on it that we're going to set it at 24 inch pounds if it had that 30,000 miles on it and you were doing something you might set it with less uh less preload like a 16 to 18 because some of that material's already gone away and it doesn't need to be as tight anymore so that being said if you which we'll probably do later uh, put different drive shafts in and you're changing your pinion flange or yoke whatever you're attaching the drive shaft to you don't want to you torque. don't want to crush it any more than it's already been crushed so I always say you're going to run it in there with your impact and you don't want to give it all the ooga -dooga 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 -dooga. just a couple of ooga doogas make sure you've got your uh, uh, red loctite on it you might even want to peen the nut when you're all done but don't crush it anymore because okay. that'll overload the bearings which is good to know yeah um in fact i think i did that to a friend's jeep once i was like yeah i can change that flange runner, <laughs> runner in hot yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so you basically would change that flange or yoke, put the new one on and then tighten it and try to get back to the 24 if you haven't really driven it much. Well, you won't be able to measure that 24 because you're already going to have oh, the ring gear. gear back in there. So you're just going off of experience. Okay. Yeah. So, like I said, it's not rocket surgery. Just don't crank on it. NASA, North American Surgery mm -hmm. Academy. All right, uh, what's next? Okay, we are, uh, what is next? You got the shim in there? So we're gonna go ahead and put this uh, pinion back in with the new crush sleeve. Uh, I'm sorry, without the new crush sleeve, we're gonna put it in with our old crush sleeve or no crush sleeve at all. We're going to... Well, do we wanna do it with this one or do we wanna do it with the new pinion? Uh, we should definitely do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> see, <laughs> see, see, you're learning fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're right, we're... Uh, you, when you change the ring gear, you also change the pinion. The pinion yeah. So what we're going to oh, do... Oh, and that's another thing that's important to tell people, is that the ring and pinion, like, they're a pair. They are a match set, yeah. They're so. like a monogamous relation. They're like two Canadian geese. Yeah. You is. have to keep those two together. You can't take our pinion out of the pile and a ring gear out of the pile and just throw them together. There is a little more science to it than that and you kind of almost can, but they would have to be all from the same run. Most people don't know that. They think that this one and that one were matched together. They weren't, they were actually on the same machine at the same settings, but that ring gear went over here and this pinion went over there and eventually they were put in the same box. So they're only matched set to that manufacturing batch. Uh, so that, it's like a Canadian pair of Canadian geese from a specific part of Canada. That's, it's just like that. <laughs> That'll but actually, you're probably gonna get all kinds of funny comments because <laughs> people are gonna disagree with that, but that is the truth. So it's, it's basically like even Motive Gear, they might have a 488 JT kit on the shelf from one run, and then like a year later they ordered a new run and they got another 488, but that doesn't mean you can take the earlier 488 and the, basically just keep the ones together that are in the axle yeah. or that are in the box. Don't yeah. go mix, mix If you match. break your ring, you can't just replace the ring. You gotta break, you gotta replace the ring and the pinion. But what if you're racing in Baja, knocking on the door of the podium? It would do anything it took to get that truck back on the road as fast as possible. If I had to put a bunch of mismatched garbage together, <laughs> exactly what I would do. <laughs> Good to know, all right. <laughs> Do as we say, not as we do. Our workbench is getting cluttered with lots of gear parts. It's the perfect workbench. All right, what is, what are you doing? What's the next uh, step? So we're gonna pull this inner pinion bearing because we're going to reuse it. Um, in some cases, sometimes you wanna get to the pinion shim that would be under there, which this is not the case because it's underneath the race. But we are gonna reuse this bearing, so we need to pull it off without doing any damage to it. In this situation, we're going to use what is an actual. So here's a question. Um, the master install kit comes with a new 
pinion, pinion bearing. bearing. Yeah. Can you use the new pinion bearing and the old race, or will that screw up our measurements? No, technically you should not. Uh, it won't screw up any measurements. There's still precision parts, but uh, that one already has a pattern made in it with this bearing. There's so the bearings and the there. races are kind of like the they, pinion and the ring gear. Like they kind of need to they've stay. They've kind of worn together. You could use, they're not matched like a ring and pinion, um, but they have been used together now. So now we want to, since we use the old race, we want to use the existing bearing. If we put the new race, um, then we would use the new bearing. Okay. So we could have we gotten away with the new, the new bearing and the new race and the, the old shims? Yes. Uh, technically, like I said, that is a precision part. So your bearings, all your races should be identical. Very, 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 very close. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of people use a funny puller. We're going to use an even funnier puller. These are specific for ring and pinion work. Um, they're not very expensive. They're maybe 150 bucks. We make them here at Motive Gear. Um, that's why they're blue. Uh, and they're worth every penny, especially if you're going to do two axles yep. or more. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to capture the bearing underneath the actual uh, inner race part. Oop. So right it's going to go in between the head of the pinion and the bearing because this part here that spins is going to slide off. But right now it's pressed on there super tight from tightening it down and having yeah, to crush yeah. it. It's probably got a 6,000th press fit or so. And then this is a perfect circle, so it's going to cap and capture the entire bearing and not pull on it one way or the other, one side or the other more. And this guy is basically a tube with a threaded shaft in the middle. And as that tightens down, it will pull apart and it will pull that bearing Except up and that off. that bearing off the pinion, yeah. So this slides on. That slides on. These go over the top, and then we use this little wedding band that is going to hold those firmly in place. Um, if you're doing more than one, I really like to keep the threads lubed. If, you're, if you don't use it very often, if you're using it daily, you definitely keep the threads lubed because you're going to put a lot of stress on them. And then we're going to hammer it and hold that. All right. Whew. Just about yeah. ran out of thread. Go ahead and pull that off of there without dropping that bearing. Here it is. A perfectly pulled off bearing without doing any damage to it. You could do that like a hundred times without doing any damage to it. Because it's grabbing on the inner race and not on the cage. Yeah, exactly. Because you grab on the cage and then kablamo. the cage and kablamo. <laughs> yeah. And what, what are we talking about? We want no zero kablamo. <laughs> um, Oh, that fell, but that was just the washer for... I don't know if you were watching that. All of our tools fell, actually. I know, there was things. What was that um, game it's when you were kids? It was like a, hot, a football game. And you had all these little football players, and then you just turn on the table, and it would just go... And they would just kind of rattle all over the place. Do you remember uh, this game? You're a couple years older than I am. Um, so maybe it was probably maybe it my it was probably my older brother's game. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't remember that one. Really? Uh, I'm sure there was other vibrating games though that we had as kids <laughs> that we could think of. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna set this on, but it's not gonna. So basically, you can see this smooth area is where the bearing was sitting, and if you drop it on there just before it gets to there, it starts getting tight. So it had been pressed all the way down onto there. So we had to pull it all the way up until it went and then it was all the way off. This smooth area up here is where the outer pinion bearing will sit, which it, goes this way and it it's has, smaller. Yeah, it's smaller and also has much less of a press fit. So I, I don't know what the actual number is. It's called six or seven thousandths, which is a pretty heavy press fit where the outer bearing I'll get calls every once in a while because the outer bearing doesn't slide on. Well, it's not supposed to. It has about a 1,000th press fit, so that's why we had to knock it out with a, uh, with a hammer. So it, it's, it's tight, but it's not as tight as the inner one. So now we're going to get the new ring and pinion, this one, throw that in the river, and this one will, will press onto the new pinion. Yeah. But you actually press it on with the press. You don't press it on. On in. that one, we're going to use a press, yeah. So this is our old pinion. This is our new pinion, it's smaller, but that's because the ratio is getting lower. So, which is numerically higher. 
Why did we? Why did we come up with that? Oh boy! If you'd have been the head in charge back then, when that was made sense, it would have been easier for gear. everybody. My Jeep needs yeah. high gears so I can run up the trail, not high gears so I can run down the highway. Um, so the whole idea is that this will have. Uh, well, let's see. What's the gear count? One, two, three, four, five, 11. six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And what is this? Five. One, two, four, six, eight. Eight. So. Um, this will turn more times for each rotation of the ring gear. And I, I don't know if this is correct, but the way I like to describe it is your engine makes torque. Let's say it makes, just for ease of numbers, 100 torques in one rotation. So you have 100 torques going into this. Now, if this turns more times per rotation of the ring gear, that means you have more torque going into one rotation of your tire. It is a torque multiplier for sure, yeah. Where right. this one, if it turns less times per rotation of a ring gear, you're putting less torque into the one rotation of the tire. Yeah. Which is also putting more stress out to your axle shaft. So that's why a lot of the time we'll put uh, chromoly axle shafts so they can go if you If you run the deeper, the more torque here. Lower, higher numerical, slower ring yes. and pinion ratio. But at the same time, even though it's multiplying torque downstream to your axle shafts, it's reducing torque to your drive shaft. Could you say that? Yeah, you could say that, yes. It'd be like using the portal, like a portal box on the out of an axle, if you're familiar with that. That means the gearing, there's gearing in the differential, but usually very um, high. So it'd be like a three to one or instead of a 488 to one. Yep. Um, and then you put your gearing out here, which then relieves a lot of the stress on everything that's before those portal boxes. So it relieves the stress on all the drive line, the axle shafts, the ring and pinion. So part of the reason you wanna do this is because you're going to bigger tires, which take more torque to get moving. So when you torque multiply it, the engine is like, hey, I'm still working the same way I always worked. But the ring gear's like, oh, I'm doing the work for you because I'm multiplying your torque so that we can turn these bigger tires. Yeah, I, I like that. You buy that? Yeah, but... <laughs> Look at this. Rocket surgeon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can you heat a bearing? You can with like something that would evenly heat the bearing. So you would do it in like a uh, oven and you're not gonna get it crazy hot or anything. Just a couple hundred degrees, or not even that high 100s and that'll that'll loosen it up and let it slip on. I put on bearings, big tractor bearings one time that we actually got a bucket of nitrogen and carefully lowered it in there and then... Um, was this at a uh, farm? It was not on a farm. <laughs> it I was, was on say, some kind of a construction job site. I was gonna say because on the farm, those big um, tanks of nitrogen, you know what they use the tanks of nitrogen for on the farm? Uh, before, besides recreational. <laughs> <laughs> so when they do artificial insemination on cows. Oh, I like this, the where guy, this is headed. The guy that shows up with the artificial um, sperm brings it in a giant tank of liquid nitrogen. Huh. Kind of, yeah. kind of, kind of like Walt Disney. Really, is Walt Disney in a giant tank of liquid nitrogen? Disney? Like Frozen? Or is that Ford? Isn't somebody Frozen? <laughs> this is all stuff I read on the internet. <laughs> you think Elon Musk is going to buy Disney? I don't know. I would be more interested in the body of Walt, I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right. More, more important. <laughs> Second part of my question. Uh, if Elon Musk buys the Walt Disney company, does he get the frozen body of Walt? Yeah. And is he going to put it into a cow somewhere in Pennsylvania? <laughs> <laughs> These are the questions that keep me up at night. Um. <laughs> uh. More? No, that's perfect. Okay. To the press? To the press. We'll put a little oil on here just to help it. Help it slide on there a little so easier. So we press the bearing on the pinion. Now... Do we put the we put the pinion back in? Correct. So what we're going to do is 
we're gonna put the pinion back in with no crush sleeve. You can use the old crush sleeve if you really want to. There's no real need to it. We're gonna put the outer bearing on and the yoke. We're going to put the nut on and drag all this together with no crush sleeve. And we're just gonna take the play out of the housing. So when we first put this in, it's gonna wobble in there. We're gonna push everything together. The two bearings are gonna go into the races and just enough to get rid of all the play. We don't need any preload at this point. Um, and then from there, we'll take our, we're gonna put our ring gear on our new e-locker and we're going to put the ring gear and e-locker into the housing. We're going to set our lash, which is the space between, basically the gap between the ring gear and the pinion gear, which uh, we're gonna set about eight thousandths. Um, and then we will run a pattern. We're gonna paint three or four teeth on the ring. We'll give it some resistance by hand and run that paint between the ring and the pinion and look at what our pet read our pattern basically so we're hope we're basically assuming hoping that the shim the factory shim that we put under that race and that five thousand is enough for the pinion depth correct and so we don't need to put this in yet not yet. until we know that our pattern is acceptable because then we'll know that the depth is right. All this is going to do is change the preload. That's the preload, exactly. Okay. And this is not This is the old one, so we're not even going to use this one anyways. We're no gonna... real need to, yeah. Okay. So we put it together. We're, we're going on the depth. We're basically going on, is it in deep enough, but not necessarily is it set for spinning preload? Yes, correct, yeah. Okay. And then once we say, all right, our pattern's super happy, we're, we're good with that, then we're going to take the carrier and the ring gear back out. We will pull this pinion back out, and that is when we're going to put our brand new crush sleeve, our seal, and our nut, and then we're gonna carefully crush this all back together to achieve that 24 inch pounds for this style of bearing. Okay. So you basically assemble everything, make sure it all fits and is happy, take it back apart, um, yeah. and then assemble it for the final time. As long as when it's happy the first time, if it's not happy the first time, then you start adjusting things. Yeah, then we're gonna, then we will pop that inner pinion race out and we'll, we'll figure out if we need to go deeper or shallow, if we need to add shim or take shim away. Um, and, and that's all based on reading the, the pattern. The pattern. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will grab the locker and the ring gear and clean up all the parts so that that's kind of ready. While you do that, I'm going to put this thing into that housing and tighten it up to where there's no play. Okay. This is the Eaton E-Locker that we are going to put in the front axle. We're going to run the same thing front and rear. Um, unlike other lockers that are air actuated or cable actuated, this has um, wires right here I can show them to you and those will actually going to run those up to the S pod that we put in this so that we can control the front and rear lockers via a switch on the dash um, it does have to have a hole drilled in the housing so that the wires can go out they will go through this grommet that's right here on the, the wire so that will seal up any leaks, but we'll have to read the instructions and figure out exactly where it wants that hole drilled and do that. And then make sure we do a clean job so we don't get a bunch of shavings inside there. So I'm gonna clean this up and clean up the ring gear and get ready to assemble this. How is the pinion? It is going great. I was waiting for you to quit jabbering because I'm gonna make all kinds of noise right now. All right, engage noise. Clean all this oil off of this, or just wipe it down? Uh, you do want to make sure there's no imperfections, anything that can set the ring, ring opinion, or the ring gear, any kind of like cattywampus, so make sure there's no um, burrs, or, burrs or yeah, leftover packaging from styrofoam and that kind of stuff. Came over here for something to cut something. Oh, a knife? Yeah. Pretty doll. They say a doll knife is like the worst type of knife, the most dangerous knife. Unless you're buttering your toast. I do like some toast. What do you want for lunch today? Mexican. Loctite on the ring gear bolts. 
Uh, it actually comes with a little bit of Loctite, but I like to add my oh. own Loctite on top of that. So this yellow stuff is the... Yes, the yellow stuff is kind of like Loctite, and this red stuff is exactly like red Loctite. Now, should the ring gear just drop right on? No, it does. It actually doesn't matter. Um, it will center itself. That's probably the most important part, but really the force comes from the bolts clamping the two surfaces together. It's not a rotational force, it's a clamping force. Okay, so line it up, put a bolt through and get it kind of started, maybe one or two of them? Yeah, yeah, and once you get it centered, then run all the other ones in there, star pattern it, and yeah, and we'll, then we'll torque it. Okay, um, so I'll get I will you find some... a little bit of Loctite. I have some over here if you... Oh. Otherwise, you're in luck, it comes in our master bearing kit along with the paint for the ring gear and do you think it matters if it's red or blue? Uh, depends on if you want it to come, uh, I mean blue. Blue is better than nothing, and red's better than blue. Um, so my question to you as a um, gear surgeon is what exactly is Loctite? Bolt glue. Why is it so expensive? And like, why is there not like a like uh, off the grid preppers make your own Loctite article online. Yeah. Big Loctite. They got, they got the science. Big Loctite's holding us, Big Loctite, yeah. holding us down. <laughs> Big adhesive holding us back. From... <laughs> holding us, holding the knowledge apart from us. Um, I think something here needs to come off because the ring gear doesn't fit over this thing. Well, this is where we refer to the instructions. Okay. I haven't done an e-locker in a while, and I don't remember having to do that, but... I mean, there's a snap ring right here. Yeah. That you I... work on breaking the edge off of your knife, and I'll grab the instructions and verify that we're doing it wrong. Okay. It's literally the only part of the instructions. <laughs> is... <laughs> what to do right there. <laughs> Am I right? Yep. So you're removing the retaining ring, which also holds the thrust bearing, thrust washer, and ramp plate in place. These do not need to be removed. Reta remove the stator. So yeah, we're just getting that stator out of there. Okay. This. And this. And somehow workbench got full really fast. Yeah. And then this. Tiny. Um, which we should probably kind of roll it up and get an eyeball on some. That's a bit of a turn. Okay. Anyway, go the other way. This one? Right there. Pleasant. That means it's time to pick the kids up from school. It's currently 1.30 p.m. sitting out there in the freezing cold of Southern California. <laughs> All the other parents have left. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sure my dad's going to show up today. <laughs> Working on Jeeps is fun. Yeah. I mean, it's what I do all the time. Just all the time. Not new Jeeps, though. This is much better. I work on really old Jeeps. Do you like the new Jeeps? Um, like you, have, you have a JK. I have a JK. It's my least favorite of all the Jeeps. I like my TJ and my Flat Fender. They say the JK frame is like the best. And by best, I mean just beefiest, not necessarily. Well, you can feel my flat fender frame flex. It's half the suspension. So uh, in comparison, they've really come a long way in 76 years. But then all of the beef that they put in the JK, they 
well, not all of it, but some of the beef they took back out for the JL because they needed fuel economy. Yeah, I had a long talk with our friend Tony about that, and almost everything in the design process revolves around fuel government regulation on the fuel economy, weight, rolling resistance. And even after doing all that, he says they still don't technically get away with everything that they're regulated by, so then they take the penalties. They're just trying to take less penalties, the oh, least wow. amount. It's pretty interesting. Be cool, they just left us alone, let us do our thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm getting all the ring gear bolts started. Um, can you reuse ring gear bolts? A lot of people don't like to, but it is not an uncommon practice to reuse them. You just make sure they're clean and lock tight them. I personally don't have a problem reusing them. I mean, what's going to... Uh, they talk about thread stretching on the torque process, and it's a pretty hard bolt. If anybody ever tells you that bolt's soft, throw it at their head, and they'll be like, oh, that was... Painfully hard. Pretty hard. Have you ever um, had a friend whose Jeep stopped moving, and then you pulled the diff cover, and all the ring gear bolts were laying in the bottom of the diff, and the ring gear was just spinning on the carrier? Yeah. That is a complaint you'll see every once in a while. It doesn't have anything to do with reusing the bolts. A lot of the time, that will either be not enough bolt prep, so they didn't clean the bolt, they didn't lock tight the bolt, they didn't torque it properly, or you have a driveline vibration that over time rattles the bolts rattles out. The bolts out. Hmm. Yeah, that happened to us on like an ultimate adventure. Like Trent McGee, we rolled out to the we rolled into like the final hotel and he was like something he was like something just gave you loose in my car and like we went and had our our party and then we came back and sat around the parking lot and pulled the diff cover and like was it salvageable or did you have to re I think we put all the bolts back in and he drove it home yeah, perfect but it was like I just took the strap for half of the Rubicon over the summer cuz I had a Detroit locker in there that all the bolts came out and just spun the case like crazy. And it made a little tink, tink, which means they were all out except for that last one. <laughs> and I don't blame them on that. I'm pretty sure it's my TJ with a massive vibration and just over time it backed all the bolts out of it. And I couldn't find one, it actually broke all the bolts. So I think they all came loose and then eventually broke them all and they were just breaking one at a time. Uh, but I didn't find any of them. All the heads had oh, gotten really? ground up inside a 513 gear that's probably so small, such a small pinion into the ring gear that the bolt never actually got into the gear, but sat there and turned and, and just ground it to nothing. There was wow. no sign of bolt heads. Was before. the housing saveable? Housing was no problem. The ring and pinion were trashed and there's so much metal went through the bearings. Oh, I bet. But I would think, like, I would be worried that, like, the housing would... The cover, I, I, I'm an aluminum guy. I like to be light. So the aluminum cover took a pretty good bashing, but it's going to be all right. But I got really good fuel mileage for the last half of the Rubicon. Because <laughs> someone else was... <laughs> <laughs> My twin brother luckily was there. <laughs> Nobody else would have drugged me all the way through there. He had to. <laughs> He did, because he's on like 38s or whatever, and I'm on little 34-inch tires on my TJ. I like to keep it simple. Does so he have we, some big built Jeep? Yeah, no, it's an LJ, but it's just much higher. It's got, you know, I'm super low to the ground and small tires, and he's much higher and bigger tires. And when it came time to cross the river over to the campsite, into the dirty dozen uh, site, uh -huh. he took me through the deepest part. <laughs> the water was coming inside. I was like, ah, that's... I see what you're doing there, funny guy. <laughs> Are you the older twin? No, I'm five minutes, five minutes younger. Huh. That's what you get for being the youngest. Yep. That's why my head's shaped normal. <laughs> he did all the hard work for me. 
<laughs> you, you were in there pushing. <laughs> I didn't torque that. That thing came together a lot easier than I expected. I kind of thought. Yeah, I like, like I said, it's not really a it's not really a press fit at all. Um, it's just to center it. So a couple ugga duggas. Uh, right there. So no, what I think we ought to do something I saw recently. Somebody while pressing the bearings on, just pushes them a little tighter and locks that thing in there, and then we'll torque it. That'd be a good way to hold it because that's a perfectly round unit. So uh, no, we'll just uh, we'll use the torque wrench in the press when we press the bearings on. Oh. I see what you're saying. Once yeah. you're pressing, when this is getting pressed on, then you can torque it to keep yeah. it from spinning. Um, or even without the, we can do it without the bearings. Either way, we can always. I knock the bearings on with a with a with a driver and a and the race and a and a hammer. The correct way would be to do it in the press. Um, but if we want to lock it into the press so that we can torque it, it's a pretty cool way to hold it. Let's do that. All right. All right. We are at the press. Um, our next step is we're going to press the bearings onto the journals of the locker. This is the journal of the locker, which is where the axle shaft goes into the locker. Um, the bearing is going to sit, eh, this isn't right either. Are Take they different two. on each side? I don't believe so. This must be a pinion. Oh, they're way different on each side. Or wait, let me see that little guy. Does that go into the middle? Oh, that's pretty close. Yeah. Doesn't need the race at that point, but oh. yeah, anyway. How's that feel? It's going. Just it'll straighten yourself out. There it is. There it is. Now we back it off and then we go to that thicker guy. Mm. There you go. That's it. That's it. We press the blocker into the uh, press. We're holding it with the press to try and torque the ring gear bolts. Just kind of a neat trick. We use the press to press on one of the side bearings. And then we clamped down on the press and put some tubes in there and locked and torqued the ring gear bolts. Now we're gonna flip it over, put the other side bearing in, carrier bearing, and then... Uh, then we're gonna push it in the housing and set latch. That's probably gonna be not close. Oh, that's pretty close. Can you fit that? That other one's too thick, huh? I think I might be able to at least get it started. All right. I've got, uh, it's all the way in my truck, but I brought all of my saved inner races that I use for this all the time, this kind of stuff. Like there's always something that works right, but that's with 20 years of saving races, hoarding stupid used car parts. <laughs> are we ready to put it in? We are ready to put it in. All right, so I'll hold it up there. All right, you do that. I'll hold it up there and you can whack them, smack them, I think. You're gonna attempt to put it in as evenly as possible without cutting your fingers off. That sounds fun. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so I need to get the little shim, the outer shim, and the bearings all lined up. And 
Wait, this guy. This guy needs to turn this way so that I don't pinch that wire. Oh, that's what those little arms are for, so that it doesn't spin. Yeah. So it actually should be. Yeah, there you go. Like that? Yeah, because it'll go on each side of the bearing cap. Isn't that the best? <laughs> will it? <laughs> it will. Right here behind us is the e-locker with the ring gear on. The pinion's already installed. And we put it in with new bearings, but with the factory shims on the outside of the bearing. And the next step is to check the backlash, which is, if this is the gear of the pinion and this is the gear of the ring gear, you want a little bit of space in between those so that they can get oil between the two teeth. Can get oil between the two so teeth. So if your backlash is too tight, you get zero oil between the two gears, creates an excessive amount of heat, takes the, ga takes the face off the gear, creates a huge amount of heat in the oil, blows it, your oil seal out, it does all kinds of funny things. Blammo. Blammo. But if it's too loose, uh, then essentially you don't want it too loose. It's going to make all kinds of noise. It'll on launch. It'll, you've got it more. It could be shocking. Yeah, yeah. So but you want it like looser the... is better than too tight. Really? Yeah. Good to know. So how do you test that? You have this. Yeah, we have what you can get at any auto parts store or Harbor Freight or anywhere. Or MotiveGear.com. Uh, or MotiveGear.com. We do have a. Uh, we do have our own kit. <laughs> uh, this is a dial indicator, so it, mag it has a magnet neck base that mounts to the housing. You extend the arm out and touch our little point here to, the, um, to any one of the teeth, and we are going to rock it ever so slightly back and forth. We come zoom in here super duper close. So as this gauge moves, it's basically the ring gear is pushing this little protruder up and down and that is measuring how much it's moving which is also measuring the gap between the ring gear and the pinion gear yeah and, and that's going to show it to us in thousands we're looking uh, a roll of thumb is eight to twelve thousands we're right at ten so from here we are now going to paint about four of these teeth and uh, both sides of the coast and the drive side and then we'll run the, the mesh through the pinion and we're going to read the pattern so question Question, Mr. Falarski, gear wizard, gear doc, space doctor. Ooh, what was it? Rocket, <laughs> rocket doctor. Rocket doctor. Um, what if you have 15? Uh, so, great question. So if you've got 15, we have a shim on both sides of the bearing. Uh, we were able to get away with the factory shim, um, and it put us right to where we wanted to. But if we were 15 thousandths, which is, uh, call it Two five, call it five thousandths, too far away from the pinion, we will add uh, basically five thousandths on this side, so it pushes the uh, ring into the pinion, and we'll remove five from here. So we're going to remove five, add five, and move that thing into the uh, uh, move that gear into the pinion, and then we'll reread our pattern. And it should be roughly the back to where we're at right now, ten thousand. Um, and if it is two thousand, then you kind of do it the other way, yeah, move typically. it away. Um, so we started this with the bearings and the shims that it had factory. Correct. What do you do if you have this axle and you bought this axle off of Marketplace and it doesn't have a carrier in it? How do you know where to even start? Uh, I would start by adding all the shim to one side, the, the ring gear side. Uh, you're just going to pick a number. You could, you could put it in with zero shim and measure the lash and subtract however many 30, 40, 50 thousandths that is. I didn't measure this one, but it looks like it's I mean, this close. was this was pretty tight to get in here. Yeah, our, our uh, preload for the carrier preload is gonna be fine. We won't have to make any changes. But I mean, I guess my question is, is like if I, if I had bought this axle and I didn't have the old bearings or the old shims, like how do I even know? Um, Just try to get it in tight? Yeah, well, you're going to start with all the shim on whatever you're going to start with. You're going to pick a shim and put it on this side and just hold it in there and check your lash. 
it's either going to be wildly too much or not even going to go in there. And that means then you're going to take some away from here and move it away. Or if it's wildly out, you're going to push it in. And then we'll add shim to this side. So once we get closer to our 10, 12, somewhere in that area, then we can kind of pick a shim here. Um, really, it's a little bit of guesswork on that. Was Is there anything, like if I buy a ring and pinion from Motive and I buy a e-locker and I buy the install kit, is there anything that says, here's a good starting point? Not really for carrier lash, no. Nothing I've ever come across. It's a... Uh, you could always start with something factory if you had if you knew that, but I don't I don't have any list on that. That's okay. A, yeah, just guesswork. But for the most part, if you do have it, if it's not an empty housing, and you've got an idea of what whatever came out with it, um, the ring and pinions are precision ground. The uh, carrier, the e locker, is a precision part too. They're usually going to be really close to what came out of it, and then you just make your adjustments from there. So, rule of thumb. Don't just pull the thing apart and throw all the parts on the ground. Like, take your time and keep an idea of where all the bearings are and all the yep. shims are and keep them separated from driver to passenger side so that you can put them back and actually start with something close to a factory. Which yeah. might be perfect. or might. Well, in our case, it is. Yeah. Um, if you were a lot smarter than me and Fred, then <laughs> you would... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would maybe even take note, get yourself a piece of paper, and you're going to take note of everything. That way, if you do make adjustments, you can just refer to your original thicknesses and go from there. What was kind of cool on this Dana 44 Advantech, what is it, 210. 210, was that the carrier bearings were different sizes, and the races were different sizes, and the shims were different sizes. So you really couldn't screw it up. No. If maybe. you have all those parts, you know that the smaller one goes on one side and the larger one goes on the other side. So it's kind of cool that they have changed it where like the old ones, it would have the same stuff side to side. And that will, since you brought that up, actually, that made it really easy to keep our bearing caps um, in order. This particular one has a tiny little arrow here that points to the outside. We made our own little arrow so we couldn't screw it up. Um, but on an older Dana, you might... Uh, it won't have those markings. Sometimes you'll put your own little two dots here and one dot on this side, but these caps should go back in the, the same way they came off. The same orientation and on the same side. Yeah. So like, don't flip them all yep. over. Not but down. this is kind of like almost idiot proof. It's almost idiot proof, but we, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll figure, it, we'll it, figure it. our way to screw it up. All right. Um, so what is next? It has to come back out. I uh, know. Now we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna paint the teeth and. Uh, now we're gonna paint the teeth and run and through and check, check our, our pattern. pattern. And if our pattern's good. Then it comes back apart. Oh, and we also have to drill a hole because we got this little wire. Oh, here. yeah, yeah. That's actually our next step. We're going to check the pattern. If the pattern's good, then we're going to take it out drill that hole. Drill that hole, and then we'll redo the pinion with the crush sleeve. Da -da 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 -da. See, we almost screwed it up already. Almost. <laughs> Situation normal. Yeah. You ready to make a pattern? Ready to make a pattern. Okay. I'll turn the pinion. You want me to turn the pinion? Yeah. Okay. You're pushing, go. okay, yeah. So we're gonna, I'm gonna put my palm with a rag up against the pinion and I'm gonna create a small load just so we can push the paint away when we actually get a good readable pattern. I guess I don't need to do it this way. Yeah, no, you can just do it by hand. I'm like a bad so. Here we go. Okay, and then go, yep, there you go. All right. Perfect. Is it at the front? That is, keep going a little more. Perfect. There we go. That is a beautiful pattern. That is a perfect swipe across both the drive see. side and the, and the coast side. If you read the actual main part of the pattern you'll see it is that there's no super sharp edges on the top or the bottom and sometimes not in this particular case if you don't get a good read on the main teeth that you painted you'll read the ghost pattern which is the teeth that follow after that but this isn't that case that's a that's a good looking pattern the ghost pattern all right let's get this wire out of the way oh it looks like a hamburger in and out burger right there. <laughs> Look at that. So when it's driving, it's pushing on 
the outside of the curve. Correct. When it's on going the, forward. The drive side, yeah. And then on the coast side the is coast. inside the curve, yeah. So whenever that somebody talks about the coast side of a gear, it's the inside of this kind of little arch. And the drive side is on the outside of the arch. And if you think about it, an arch is stronger when you're pushing it from the outside versus trying to push. And that's why whenever you put a reverse rotation or high pinion gear in the back of a vehicle, it drives on the coast side of the gear. Which is the wrong side. Which is why it is weaker. Yep. Look at that. And the same, same with a, like an older TJ that has a low pinion. Technically, you're driving forward on the coast side of the gear. That's why a lot of people will upgrade to like a XJ front end that does a reverse cut, so that now you're on the drive side of the front gear when you're um, moving forward. And forward gets you further down the trail than backwards. But it's funny, because like a lot of older 4x4s, they all had low pinions. Like was, was reverse rotation or high pinion like a later technology? No, it must have been people playing catch up because Ford was reverse forever. Yeah. On their 44s and their 60s where GM, same thing, 44 to 60, but always ran a low pinion in the front. Yeah, they and even Dodges a... had 60s with low pinions. In the, like yeah, Clampy can. Truck is a low pinion 60 in the front and it's the, almost identical to a Dodge. Actually, the center section, I think the center section is a Dodge. No, I've got that backwards. The knuckles are Dodge and the center section is Chevy on Clampy Truck. But both Chevy and Dodge, low pinion front 60s. Yeah, that, uh, maybe it was an arm wrestling match behind the scenes that Ford thought they knew what they were doing and Chevy thought they were knew what they were doing. It turns out Ford won that match. Well, and Jeep never went to a high pinion front until XJ? XJ. Because you'd get a YJ. YJ. No, YJ was always high pinion also. So XJ went to the high pinion like in 84 uh, or 86, 84, 84, I think. So you could never get a CJ with a high pinion front? No. Yep. Okay, enough history lessons. Back to the axle at hand. Uh, what is our next step? Okay, Pull so we've got, a, yeah, we've got a good pattern. We are, uh, we are now going to take that carrier out. We're gonna drill our hole for the E-locker. Um, while we do that, we're going to then do our final assembly on the pinion. So we know we have our pinion depth correct. We're going to put our new crush sleeve, our new seal, and our new nut. And then set our drag or our pinion preload to 24 inch pounds on this one, um, which is exactly what it came out with because we're reusing those uh, pinion bearings. All right, so I'm gonna pull this out, keep everything tidy, and you're gonna pull the pinion. I'll do all that. You make all kinds of shavings. I'll, yeah, I'll get the, ready to drill that hole and then I'll bring my shop vac over and we'll try to clean everything out nice and tidy. And this thing will be back together and we'll be peeling out in no time. Yep. And we just have to do the rear axle. Maybe in another episode. Maybe after dinner. I'm gonna push this through. You're gonna put that yoke on and you're probably gonna have to tap it on. Um, with like I'm gonna hold that thing and you're gonna tap the yoke on this guy. until you get enough to at least get the nut on it. Okay, so we have drilled out the housing for the wires for the locker. Correct. Correct. We have uh, removed the pinion and we're ready to put the crush sleeve on the pinion. We put the outer pinions uh, bearing and seal in. So our next step is to assemble the pinion for good. For good, because we've got a good pattern. Now we're gonna put this in with our new crush sleeve, our new seal, and our new nut, and we're gonna crush everything until we get that 24 inch pounds for new bearings, 16 to 18 for used bearings, super used bearings. Um, so once we get our pinion preload of 24 inch pounds, we'll be done with this part, and then we'll go into the carrier install. How do you install, how do you crush the crush sleeve just to 24 inch pounds? You just like incrementally, yeah. So we're gonna start, when we put this thing in, we're gonna slide our yoke on and our new nut. We're gonna tighten it down. We'll probably use the impact gun for a little bit and it's still gonna have a little in and out uh, play. 
We're going to get it to where they're just to right where there is no in and out play. And then we're going to be very careful and incrementally tighten it until and check it with our inch pound torque wrench to make sure we've got 24 inch pounds up to 24 inch pounds. So if you had a solid spacer, you would not have a crush sleeve, but then you would be adding shims. Yeah. So then you would use it's essentially it's the same thing. You can go either way. One's People think the crush sleeve or the solid spacer is better. Um, there's no real argument there. Uh, but if you still have in and out play or not enough um, uh, preload, preload, you're going to. This would be before you put the seal in because you're going to get that. Because you're doing this. Because you're taking it in and out. Yeah. Uh, then you would have to take it out and add two more thousands. Put it in there. Set it all up again. Not enough preload again. Take it all back out. Add two or three more thousand. You know, depending on what you're at. So this is this is easier, easier to screw up. Okay. Um, but at, in the end, they do the same thing. So this is basically acting like a spring. That's in a way without the spring back, but yeah. Yeah. It's acting like a crush sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> it's acting like what it is. All right. Um, so you're gonna put hold that up in there, and I'm gonna slide this on. You're gonna take this hammer. I'm gonna take this hammer so I can knock it in there. Yeah. I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna put this pinion in just like now. And I'm going to hold it in with my bare hand while you slide that yoke on. Okay. And then... Come on over here to Yokesville. You get on there and you're going to tap it on to at least get enough threads showing that... Uh, Alright. Alright. Here's your I new nut and that funny washer. Um, do we need Loctite or anything on this? Uh, yes, we do. That is a great question. It's right here. Now I'm going to hold it. If you've got, you have the nut on with at least a few threads. I do. I'm going to kind of hold it and you Gently. hammer on it for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, long way to go. So we're going to use the impact to get it as close as we can, just to saving time and muscle strength. Um, and once we get really, really close, which the impact should get us on a smaller differential like this, then we'll go to something to hold the yoke and, uh, and a breaker bar. So the fact that it's moving like this much, that's what we're trying to get rid of. Yes. Okay. Gently. Gently. Keep going. Yeah, give her one more. Yeah, let's go by hand now. So that's go by hand. that's close enough to where we can start being careful. It still has a little, just a little bit of in and out, and we're gonna go ahead and suck that up with a uh, with this breaker bar. Breaker bar. And we're going to put that that pry bar on the yoke. I think it's. Right there on the bench yep. on the left side. We're going to hold it up against the link or something that'll hold it. So the idea here is that I tighten this. Oh, geez. Yeah, I mentioned we might need a cheater bar. A few years ago, while Fred's goofing off finding us something, a few years ago we were setting up a 11 and a half for Fred's Cummins Jeep. And we had a, we first we had to start the crush with a press. And then we had what, a six or eight foot cheater bar with a high lift jack, and all kinds of stuff involved to hold it and get enough leverage on it to crush the press leave. This would be a lot easier than that one. It seems like some of that stuff you should um, that would be like an example where you wouldn't want a crush sleeve and you would want a solid space. Yeah, sleeve. yeah, absolutely. There was actually a lot of examples we were setting. <laughs> <laughs> it looked incredibly dangerous. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take that off. I wanna see where... We still got a ways to go. It's almost there. Do that again. Hold on. 
Okay, tighten it up. All right. So we still have just a little bit of play. We're going to get rid of that right now. Okay, we essentially have zero play. So zero in and out, zero up and down. We are going to now very carefully and incrementally tighten it. And then we're going to grab our inch pound torque wrench and we'll check. Right now we've got nothing, so we still have to. So this should. Oh, it probably has like four thousand or four inch pounds. Really close. We're actually close. Well, we're gonna get it on this next one okay. or two. So, so it's got to go all the way up to there. Yeah, exactly. And right now we're at yeah hardly like anything. Three or four. Okay. But it's not gonna take very much to get the rest of the way. Okay. So be gentle. Be gentle. It's going to be like, I don't know, like eighth of a turn kind of thing. Okay. So like, don't use the cheater? Uh, I think you're going to have to. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's try that. It's not quite there, but that's halfway there at least. We get calls all the time where people want to order two or three crushed leaves. I mean, well, why don't you just do it right the first time? <laughs> <laughs> because I would think that even if you do it wrong the first time, the next one's not going to be like... Well, yeah, everyone needs a lesson. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is like, it's not like the crushed sleeve is like, oh, well you did six turns, well you should have done five and a half. It's yeah. like, it's gonna be a little different. It's never really up front to you, yeah. This is actually really fun in your buddy's driveway, garage, floor kind of thing. On the ground, yeah. under your Jeep. All right. <clears throat> I don't wanna be a guy that makes the lesson of that feels better. That yeah. looks good. To get it to start moving, it goes up. But then it should be rotational for us, yeah, not the braking. Uh -uh. Ah, see that is much better, isn't it? Yeah, it, it looked like it was. Right? It looked like it was at like sixteen. No, it's over twenty. It's just over twenty. <laughs> it's jumping from 15 to 35. To there you go. That's that's the number you were looking at. What? Okay. Let me uh, let me go get mine real quick. Okay. And, uh, and we'll double down on that measurement. Okay. But it feels good. It sure does. I mean, if I was doing these gears, I would say it feels good. Luckily, you're doing these gears, and I'm just hanging around for the <laughs> entertainment. I think setting up gears and ring opinion is um, something everybody should learn to do. I don't think I do it nearly enough to feel confident to do it, especially for like Jeep like this that we're giving away. But I think that if you have the opportunity, you should learn to set up ring opinions and you should do it as much as possible and um, work with somebody that has done it in the past and then just like practice and practice and practice and learn and learn. And the other thing that's crazy is like, as soon as you learn it on this Jeep, you move to a different axle and it's a little bit different. 14 bolt has adjuster thingies. Uh, Toyota has a dropout style. So you kind of have to not just learn how to do ring and pinion, you kind of have to learn the theory behind why everything's moving in different directions and doing the things it's doing so that you can apply that to the next axle you're working on. I like these little needle ones better for doing this kind of. All right, let's see. There we go, it's 100. <laughs> uh, 
Oh yeah. So yeah, like when you're moving, it looks like it's right at yeah. In and the it was 20. just over just over twenty, and that's that's what we're looking for. So the thing that's weird is like it has to go, it has to ramp up to like eighty inch pounds to get it to start See, turning. That would be like you're breaking, yeah. And what you're looking for, and the and the measurement that you're going to get out of any spicer book or or uh, uh, specification book is going to be total rotational, or not total, but rotational, not not breaking. Huh. That would be very confusing if you were like. 14 year old kid setting up your first ring and pinion in your XJ in the rain in the backyard of your mom and dad's house. I would bet the most common thing that people mess up is crush they, leaf. The, the crush leaf. They either over crush it or they crush it too much and then back it off, which is a bad idea. Um, but generally, what they'll do is they'll over crush the, uh, this is basically too much um, pinion preload and it burns, burns the oil, burns the bearings. That's the most common failure from, from installs. I have, a, I have a suggestion that you get rid of the crush sleeve and you put a spring in there. Yeah. You think that would work? It would essentially do the same thing. I don't know if it would work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go back to the motive <laughs> gear engineers engine nerds and be like this guy fred williams came up with he wants to build a spring a crush spring so that if you overdo it you just back it out and it would just be like oh calm down oh big e the man's a genius <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first on this dirt daily fred invents a gadget that doesn't make any sense the egyptians would have done it if it would have been the right way to do it. You know, one thing we should have taken note on, and if we're still recording, we'll throw it in there, is that we pre-lubed the bearings. Yes. Especially the outer, because that'll be the last one to get oil. So we pre-lubed all the bearings with oil. So when I put the seal in, before I put the seal in, we put oil on the bearing that's on the outside here. So, because as you start driving, um, it's not going to get up there right away. But then what, after like the first hundred miles, it, there's like, it would hold oil up in there? Oh no, it'll get it pretty quick, but it's just an extra thing so it doesn't have a dry start. Oh. There's actually assembly lube on it to begin with, but just a little extra gear oil, uh, you know, anything helps, it's not a bad idea. But does this housing have like something up there that holds the oil on the bearing? There are baffles that hold it up there longer, usually on a, on a high pinion. Um, holds it up there longer, just so it doesn't run dry um, ever, or you know, it just keeps it slows the oil down from getting away from it. So, on the like Mopar Ultimate Dana 44 that's in the front of Noob Sock, mm -hmm. I think it has two fill plugs, and they literally said use the top fill plug the first time you fill it, and then use the bottom fill plug every time after that because the first time it'll launch oil up in there and it like would hold oil. Yeah, I would bet the first time it's actually, not that it launches it, it's actually high enough to get to the valley. Oh, into the bearing. That it gets to the bearing. So kind of doing the same thing. I mean, the second you, re the second you start turning it. It just goes got, everywhere. I mean, yeah, the ring gear's throwing oil up there. Yeah. We're just taking one extra step so we don't have a dry start. Make us feel better. Yeah. All right. Um, so are we putting the diff in now? Yeah, now we're gonna put the carrier in. We're, we're to assembly mode now. Um, we had our carrier preload felt fine, so we're gonna go ahead and put all that in. Put our bearing caps on. Put our wire through that little hole. Yep, we'll do that first for the e-locker. Um, and put our axle shafts back in. Dude, we're just about done. We're doing pretty good. I mean, there's still come across a lot any to major do. hurdles, which is always fun. It's because we're so good at this. So that's what I, we should have showed was like what the old crush sleeve was versus the new one. I think we can do that. Oh, with like the, the parts for the rear. Yeah. Where are we? Okay. So it is almost identical. Yeah, you really, it's, you're not crushing it that much. I so it's not even like you could like measure this height and then grab this one and put it in the press to that height because well, they're, no, they're so close that you might overdo it. But if we were going to make a number out of it, 
So it's 1.53, which I think is the old one. Yeah. And this is 1.58, so 30 thousandths. We crushed it 30 thousandths, which isn't very much. 5.3 to 5.8. Oh, 5,000, 50,000, I'm sorry. I do differential work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you couldn't like measure your crush sleeve and then measure your new one and be like, yeah, just crush it down to that. No. Because. It's just different variances. Well, and plus we have that spacer in there. Which spacer? That we put that shim behind that, uh, yeah, that so if make, anything that would make it out, yeah. that would be bigger yeah so that's perfect perfect reason why you can't do that huh. i never even considered it so i didn't even think about it but that's that's the why <laughs> that's the why it's funny because it's like all very scientific but there's also a lot of feel and experience correct i think that's the thing that always like gets me sideways on doing gears it's like if it was just like put slot A into slot B and then tighten to X, Y, Z, it would be like, oh, okay. But it's not. It's like that plus, you got to feel you a little here. I don't know what your yeah. carrier preload should feel like. And yeah. Then, yeah, you should know about the pinion preload. And I, I, I went to school for this. I went to the Universal Technical Institute when I was 30 years ago. Um, so I went through a differential class. And then I'm a big Jeep dork. So I've broken lots of differentials and I've set up lots of differentials. So. I always feel pretty confident when I get behind the, uh, behind the wrench. Behind the inch. The inch wrench. Inch wrench. All right, let's put the rest of this together. All right. Okay. Filarski and I are going to put the differential in. I'm going to grab, what do I need? The hammer and the brass drift. So if we hit it, we're going to hit it with this brass drift so that it doesn't damage anything. Go. Um, how can I help? Um, just stick. <laughs> Stay out of the way, Williams. Oh, oh. So right there, and if you can kind of tap these into place, or so gently. See if you can get this one back. Back down. Yeah, down in there. One thing about carrier preload is if you can put it in by hand, it's too loose. It's too loose. Yeah, you should, you should have to knock it in just like this. This. This is all in. This is the wire that needs to go through the housing. We drilled a hole through the back right underneath this vent. So this wire, and there's a grommet right there that will seal it. And so we need to feed these wires through that hole and then press the grommet in, but do it in such a way that you can still get this cap on. Now, here's a question. Do you run another pattern? No, no need for the pattern. Um, we are going to just double check our backlash. Just for kicks. Fred's ring gear shop, come on down. We'll tear your junk apart. Oh, you know what we also have is some diff covers from our friends at Fabtech. Motive gear make their own 
diff covers? We talk about it all the time, but we have so many friends that already make them in the industry that we let them have that market. Once again, it's just We're me on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you talking. <laughs> <laughs> this episode's going to be great because it's going to be a lot of me talking and then like the back of my head as I'm listening to you over here, like showing me some technical thing. Uh, um, let's put axle shafts in and then we'll do the cover thing. cover thing. That way we know that everything's kosher and copacetic. So you're putting that inner shaft in and then the snap ring. Snap ring, yeah. Track with my little baby hammer that you gave me. Over here in the dark. <laughs> A little bit of red Loctite on the unit bearing bolts. Unit bearing bolts are still like amazing to me. Like the fact that these three bolts are going to hold your 37 inch tall tire on. Hey, this. Well, this Jeep has 37s. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to 30s? <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> yeah, because it's going to be some like old dude that's like, I don't want to climb up in that. I just want to drive it to town and buy a couple screws for this fence I'm building. Okay, we have the axle shafts back in. We have the differential in. We have the wire coming through that little hole through the little grommet so we can wire in the locker. We have the fad front axle disconnect back together with the little motor back on. We have to put the little skid plate on that. Oh, did you already get that? Oh, little skid plate is on. Um, we put the rotors back on, the unit bearings back in, uh, the speed sensor back in, the calipers back on, and we are tightening up the caliper bolts. The front axle is just about back together. We have to put a diff cover on, which we have some aftermarket ones that we'll show you in a second. and. The tie rod, which I'm going to wait on the tie rod. Well, we'll put the tie rod in, but I'm going to replace those nylocks with new nylocks when those get here. I ordered up some new ones because I don't like to reuse nylocks. Um, it's just about all together. We're probably going to wrap this episode up and not show you the rear. The rear is pretty much the same thing um, other than all the steering stuff, but there is a bearing that is funky on the rear. The outer pinion bearing, the one that is right by the flange, is, do you have it? This thing, Weirdo bearing. which looks like a punk rock bracelet that Filarski would have worn when he was going to the clubs back in 91. Um, it's a roll, it's like a weird ball bearing with a kind of plastic polymer race, uh, not race, a cage. And this is what goes on the outside of the pinion. Why? Why do we think they have this? Just fuel economy? Think it rolls better? That's my best guess is it rolls a little bit lighter and they had the, there's rolling resistance and that goes to fuel economy. So, so when you are do, when you're setting this up, you want even less preload. Yes. There was a, uh, we took a measurement before we took it apart and it had five inch pounds of pinion preload on this. This particular regular roller bearing uh, was a, a cone style bearing, was 24 inch pounds. And that from the factory only had five and I think the spec is seven. Okay, so the whole idea is that you don't wanna over tighten this, um, probably because of this like polymer cage, if you over tighten it, something could crack or bind or break. So that's really the only difference when you're doing the rear. Yeah. Um, and the hole what you'll drill for the electric lockers in a little different spot. But for the most part, the rest of it's kind of... The rear's even easier. The axles come out even easier. No, no disconnect. It's a... Uh, do the hard one first. Yeah. Um, here, you can take that. I'm going to find that diff cover, put that on, and we will be just about done with this dirt daily. Diff cover, where are you? Thanks for coming up and playing Axel, Eric. This was a really good time. I like working on cars. <laughs> I mean, it could have been worse. I thought this all went really smooth, so that was... Yeah. That was perfect. We had everything we needed. 
Next time I'll be sure and get the wrong parts and we'll do it outside in the gravel. Yeah, we could overcrest the sleeve or something. And... Oh, you're coming out. Ready? Come on, come on. Making a mess. I know. Come on, just start. That's what I get for talking in class. The cover's beefy. It's like three eighths and quarter. And hit all the rocks. No way, man. The nice old guy that's gonna win this is gonna drive it with such skill. on this way across the Rubicon to hit the hardware store and by Lake Tahoe. <laughs> Come smile on camera. All right, diff covers in, oil is in, axle shafts are in, drive shafts back in. Brakes, new locker, new 488 ring and pinion. Um, we didn't even talk about like how do you decide which gear ratio to go with. It's sort of known uh, at, at this point. This, these have been around for what, five years now? Yep. Um, with a 37, you can go, depending on your style of driving, if you're more highway, this is California, so they go a little faster. Um, and this is the Cal 4 wheel Jeep. so. It's gonna, you know, may wanna do 85 down the freeway. Uh, so we're gonna go with a 48 just to get it into eighth gear and best economy. I myself, if I'm a desert donkey, all my Jeeps live in the desert, um, I would have gone with like a 513 because I want a little more power out of every turn, um, but I'm gonna suffer on fuel mileage. So 48s it is. Okay, um, 488s. We're going to put the tie rod back in and call it a night. That's it for this Dirt Daily. Um, if you're looking for gears, uh, check out Motive Gear. They also offer a line of limited slips and some lockers. Correct. Limited slips, lockers, and performance axles. Chrome only axles for the front and rear of these. As well as for lots of other vehicles. And so not just... From OE to performance to Jeeps to cars to hot rods. And if you're looking for a selectable locker, um, check out the guys from Eaton who make that e-locker. And don't forget Fabtech who made a lot of the other parts on this. Um, go to the Cal Four Wheel website, buy your raffle tickets. You will request the raffle tickets. They will send them to you. You have to send your donation payment back in in order to get in the drawing. So you have to go through a little bit more steps because California has weird uh, raffle laws where you can't just buy it online. You got to do this, mail it back and forth. But it's for a good cause. It keeps the trails open. You, One of you will win this. I think they're doing the drawing in February. And like I said before, not only do you win a Jeep, but you're going to win a spot on a Jeep Jamboree somewhere in America. So even if you live in Arkansas, Tucky, New Hampshire, um, you could win this thing and go on a Jeep Jamboree somewhere if you haven't really been off-roading a lot. But um, let me know if you win and which one you're going to go to. Maybe Flarsky and I will show up and ride along and eat your lunch. It's a four-seater. It's a four-seater. All right. That's it for this Dirt Daily. We'll see you guys next time. We're going to go mess around with the rear axle, um, and we will see you on another episode.